it's so for some parts it's it's good to be in the last person presenting for some it's not really the best thing to be it's actually good to be the last person presenting because i can get to refer back to all the other presentations and i really do think that we kind of came full circle i you will know why uh, in just a few minutes uh but also i Thank you for sticking us, sticking with us, uh, us for so long. So my name is Istvan Smozhansky, which might sound very familiar to you actually, because at least I'm told it's uh, the name is of Polish origin. But most people are not Polish uh, on Earth, so I just usually stick with Flaki, uh, which also should be familiar to you. Uh, no coincidence, and people keep sending me pictures of tripe soup when they are visiting Poland. Hey, this is you. I was like, yeah, not really, but, but yeah, so, and my talk is going to be about hardware, about JavaScript, and about play. So, uh, we already talked about JavaScript, a, a bunch about hardware, mostly VR hardware. We are going even uh, smaller scale than that. And a bunch of play, so it really fits right in. Uh, so, like I said, my name is Istvan Smarzanski, I'm a... Mozilla Tech Speaker, that's the blue and the heart, uh, that's what it means. It's a Mozilla program that uh, people who talk about pro topics uh, that Mozilla cares about, like VR, for example, or uh, like generally the open web, uh, Mozilla helps them and works with them to be able to present uh, to wider, to reach a wider audience and to improve, uh, help improve their, uh, their talks and their own uh, uh, knowledge and skills. So when I'm not a Mozilla Tech speaker, uh, I'm a JavaScript developer. Uh, I do consulting, I do a bunch of other things. Uh, and I also, like, uh, also contribute to a bunch of open source projects besides Mozilla as well. And one is the Tesla project, which is, which is a open source hardware. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a Raspberry Pi, it's just smaller and uh, runs Node.js out of the box uh, for prototyping. It's also like a fully open source, open project. So that's about me. And let's talk about uh, a project we, we did last year. The whole, uh, most of what you see here came out of this project. It's called Happy Code Friends. And here's a shout out to the awesomes, uh, which uh, whoever heard of the awesomes here. Uh, it's a Polish, oh nice, uh, it's a Polish uh, version or a Polish uh, uh, a friend of our Happy Code Friends uh, thing. Uh, so the awesome teaches uh, CSS and HTML uh, web development basics to uh, people here in, here in Warsaw. Uh, and uh, Happy Code Friends set out on the very same uh, playing field, we are teaching uh, underrepresented groups, uh, people of all uh, uh, origins, uh, HTML, uh, CSS, and we tried to teach them a bit of JavaScript until we realized teaching JavaScript to people who never really coded is not as easy as teaching HTML or CSS. Like you can get, you know, you, know, get, you can grasp the basics of HTML and CSS pretty easily, or A-frame, for example. Uh, but you know, programming basics like ifs and loops and variables, like and functions and function calls and asynchron and synchron things, like that really like you need a bit more time and you uh, you need a bit more content for that. There are all kinds of different things that that teach that. You know, you have block editors that help you piece together a program code like a like a puzzle and all kinds of ways people are teaching JavaScript and basic programming knowledge. Uh, but we really felt, I really felt, uh, that it was not enough and it was not low level enough. Uh, and I started doing this project called Code Invaders, which is basically um, teaching you the basics of JavaScript in like 100 lines of JavaScript code, maybe. Uh, what you see on the screen is actually a recording of the, uh, the thing. So teaching you code uh, teaching you the basics of 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 programming, you know, uh, uh, loops and the basics of variables of function calls uh, while inside the browser. 
Why it was also in, uh, in interesting is because uh, we also realized that uh, you have to motivate people. And even though a bunch of things, uh, you can already learn computing in a lot of different ways, but motivation is usually lacking. Uh, not just motivation as in sticking with it, but also motivation in uh, actually being interested and excited about creating. Uh, I think the most important aspect of programming is really creating. And if you feel that you are creating, if you are feeling that uh, your, your creation is forming under your own hands, it keeps you much more immersed uh, than, than in any other ways of learning. Uh, this came out uh, uh, as a as a driving factor of what you uh, I'm going to show you uh, the code the pro uh, program or application or whatever you call it called Cloudy Boy is to make even programming or creating or IoT or hardware more entertaining more exciting by infusing it with a bit of games. Uh, because who, who doesn't want to play? Uh, who doesn't like to play? Uh, but there is a point when, uh, when you can fuse playing with creating, and that's why creating games. Who would not want to see their own game uh, come to life on their own hands? So that's where Code Invaders took us, and that's how uh, Cloud Boy happened, because we realized... Uh, that you could put all this the knowledge that you just used, uh, that, you, uh, that you just acquired, uh, you could put it into good use and put it onto a small device like this one. Uh, we are going to see this in a moment, what, what this device is. It's an Arduboy. Have, have you, uh, any of you heard of the Arduboy here? All righty, you're going to meet them soon enough. Because the Arduboy is basically this contraption you see here, and the same contraption you can see in here. Whoever heard of an Arduino before? All right, much many, uh, much more. Uh, so what you see here is actually an Arduino. Uh, this Arduino is like five dollars. Uh, you can buy it off eBay. Wait like half a year, no, but at least a, mo a month for it to arrive from China, right? But it's free shipping, so who, who wants to complain? So you buy it for five dollars. You buy some extras. Uh, what you see uh, see here is basically a few buttons. Uh, that's a piezo speaker and basically a a small OLED screen, and you just hook it up. All all of it, you just hook it up to the to the Arduino, and what you basically got is a is a, a is a mini Game Boy or a mini game machine because you have a screen, you have sound device, you have some buttons that you can control, and you have a central processing unit that can you can program right. Now, this was the idea of the guy who created Ardu Boy uh, back in the days, which you see on the left-hand side. And you can also see here if I find it. Yeah. So this is, this is what we are talking about. This is the size, you know, this one compacted and kickstartered and put into a nice uh, casing. So just... So this is the device that we are talking about. And what happening on the screen might be actually familiar to you from, from an earlier slide, but that, let's just not go there just yet. So what happens here is basically you pull together all these different components that are open source and just put it into a nice casing. That's what uh, Kevin Bates, the creator of Order Boy, did. And what they did is they created a Kickstarter campaign for it. And Kickstarter got huge, like every who who doesn't want a thing like this, right? And it's like forty dollars. Uh, it's pretty pretty reasonable price uh, if you consider that just a Raspberry Pi will cost you thirty five dollars, right? And this is a whole complete gaming device. And what was the uh, what was, uh, what what they were saying is, hey, and it's all open source. You can just install the Arduino IDE and create games for it, and just upload it to GitHub. And people will download it and will play your games. And, be, and everybody's going to be happy. There's going to be loads of uh, games all up on the internet. Somehow, and they sold 10,000 units. They created, Kevin spent like half a year in, chi uh, in China. And uh, uh, the devices started shipping. And somehow the 
gazillion of games didn't just appear out of nothing. There were some nice games, actually. Uh, but there wasn't really... I mean, this is an open source thing. Uh, this is an open platform. Everybody could create games. Why weren't they creating games in the first place? So the problem, the first problem is the Arduino IDE. First of all, you had to download 200 megabytes, install it. The Arduino IDE is written in Java, at least the uh, earlier version, but this was, this was still a thing. A new Arduino IDE actually is web-based, and it's becoming much, much nicer. But the old one, you have to install it. You have to start writing C or C++. If anybody here can tell, C and C, writing C and C++ is terrible uh, for someone who is just writing their first program. It's terrible for someone who, 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 is, who is actually capable of writing C and C++. Those people actually work with C and C++. But you can tell about those people, they don't really have a whole lot of time, right? Because they are busy writing C and C++ for lots of money and for big corporates. Uh, so they really do not end up creating uh, boatloads of games for an open platform which they cannot sell. So, and a few of these issues came together uh, that really, like, the platform didn't really lift off. And, you know, all these barriers of entry, uh, entries, uh, are problematic when you're trying to create an ecosystem for your product. Uh, when we are talking about VR, when we are when we are talking about the web, we are all talking about ecosystems. And building an ecosystem is much harder than building just a language or a product. And uh, all all these all these all these things lead to one another. And I I start thinking, and I realize, hey, wait a second, like this thing. Usually, like a hundred lines of JavaScript, I can pretty much easily like do this in probably like what two hundred lines of C code, and it actually is pretty easy to do something like this in C code uh, when you take away all the boilerplate. I mean, what makes it this easy in JavaScript is the Dome APIs that we have, the Canvas API that makes it so much uh, so much easier for you to create pixels, to, to write sprites, to animate things 16 frames per second. So all you need to do actually is just put all the boilerplate there on the hardware and the rest is pretty straightforward. If you want to move left, you just see if the left button is pushed and if it's pushed, you just uh, change a variable and the next time uh, the screen is redrawn, your ship will appear two, two pixels to the left. This is pretty easy. This uh, telling this to the computer in JavaScript and telling this to the computer in C is basically the same thing, right? So what if we actually created a game in HTML5 and in the browser and just put it onto a uh, hardware like this? And that solves a, a gazillion of different problems. You can create a game in the browser. So what you will get is you will get instant updates. Whatever you change the code in here, uh, it's just the web. It just runs into your browser. So you can preview how your application will look like. Uh, you can also get a lot of uh, other things free. Like, for example, you don't have to care about C and memory management because JavaScript does it for you. And I mean, uh, on these limited hardwares, uh, when you are creating complex games, you will have to go there. But you don't want to create complex games. You just want to create silly games to get into all this. You don't have to create the next uh, Unreal Tournament. You just have, uh, want to create something that you just made. And there is also, you know, everybody has uh, who has a Raspberry Pi or who has an Air Arduino, it either lies into, in, in the drawer or they either did the tutorial, they blinked the LED, and now it lies in the drawer. I mean, blinking the LED is nice. It's, it's the hollow world of IoT and computing. But it's not really exciting, is it? I mean, yay, my LED is, uh, LED is blinking. What, what do I do now? And to, you know, step one step further, you know, start working with sensors, actually connect to the internet, Wi-Fi, uh, you will need much more hardware, much more expertise. 
then you're gonna get events going all around, you know, somebody pushed the button, something downloaded from the internet, and you're there in a C++ hell of not knowing what, what is gonna happen. Uh, in, in this case, actually, games are pretty straightforward. You want to run something as fast as you can, you want to update the screen as fast as you can, ideally like 60 times a second, and you want to see if the, uh, the users interacted with the game. You have a few buttons and that's it. You may want to uh, play some sounds, but that really is as, you know, as concurrent and as complicated it gets. But it's still fun, right? I mean, just look at that. I mean, this might not look much fun, but it actually, uh, just creating this in a few hours, it actually could feel pretty, pretty fun. And so what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a different thing. You might actually know this from somewhere. Just raise your hand if you have seen this anywhere. Look at that. Oh, that's a dino. <laughs> I probably should try to, to survive. So yeah. So that's, uh, if any one of you have seen this, any one of you have been uh, without internet connection on the Chrome browser, you would have seen this game, this mini game that's in, uh, built into the Chrome browser and that uses this offline dino that jumps around and tries to avoid uh, the cacti. Uh, just to, you know, just to pass some time until your internet connection re uh, recovers, until you go and unplug your router and then plug it back in, right? Uh, to fix the internet connection. This game is a bit more complicated, but it still fits on this device. It still fought, fits on this computer. And I'm gonna prove it to you uh, by switching to the camera. And so here's our little device. Let me just plug some electricity in. So basically I'm just plugging in for power. Uh, yeah, there, there is sound as well. The exact same thing running on the device. Except it's buggy a bit. There we go. So okay, how do you do that? I mean, I already told you how do you do that. You just write the game in HTML5 and then just do some magic and it appears on the device, right? Well, it turns out that magic is not a whole lot more complicated, but it's still a lot of work to do because what you basically want to do is here you have the game and your game is written in, in, in JavaScript and HTML5. Uh, and what you do is you compile some of those bits into function calls in C. So, but what you're essentially doing is translating from JavaScript to C. Now, I told you that we are coming full circle and what Link Lark was presenting to you is actually translating C and C++ into something that you can run in the browser. And now I'm showing you that you can actually do the same on the other way around. You could translate something from JavaScript and turn it into something that's C or C++. Obviously, there is no one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you cannot do this one-on-one. -on -one. There are some limitations. There are some problems that you will have to avoid. But the very basics at the very baseline, JavaScript is not all that different for C or C++. At least, especially when it comes to Arduinos and their APIs that are running on that. So basically what we are doing, we are making sure that on, uh, on a JavaScript canvas, we are displaying the same thing that we would be displaying on the pixel graphic display on this Arduino device. Uh, basically what we are doing is we are making sure that this, we are generating the same noises with the web audio API that we would be generating with the piezo speakers on the device itself. We are making sure we are translating the keys pressed on the device uh, onto the, uh, and we are detecting the same keys on the physical hardware. Once you do the abstractions that needed for that, the rest of the code is really just telling the device, hey, if somebody push this button, just move this variable, uh, like decrease this variable. So the next rendering, the next repainting will put the turret 
like two two pixels to the left. And why why I'm telling you that we are coming full circle because what you have heard before, uh, the benefit of the web and the superpower of the web is progressive enhancement. So what you have with progressive enhancement is uh, you have to make sure that you prepared for all kinds of devices. You had to make sure that prepared uh, for all kinds of screen sizes and input methods. And this is the same thing. Hey, why don't I just play, for example, uh -huh. Let's see. why don't I just play with a joypad? Because it's basically the same thing, right? Why, once I have the abstractions, I just uh, can just connect a Bluetooth joystick uh, to my computer and play the same thing, play the same game on the same computer with the same devices. Oh, hey, what about, you know, I mean, this is just a browser, right? So what I could do is I could just put this on my phone. And when I put this on my phone, uh, let me see if I pull up the camera for you. So I just type a address, and you can try this yourself. It's cld.by, like cloud the boy, slash your JS, which is the conference that I presented this last year. It's a great conference in the rural area in Germany. And then you're just reacting to the to the touch screen, right? I actually have the other demo running, cld.bi slash invaders. You can try this on your own phone, invaders. And I can, you know, just move around and shoot aliens out of the stars. And it works just the same. Hey, whatever. This is a phone, right? This has an SLRO meter. Well, how about using the SRO meter to control uh, actually the pitch? That becomes a nice thing because when you're starting to comprehend all these abstractions, you're going to end up with devices completely different. The fox is falling asleep. I hope you're not falling asleep. Because then you're going to arrive to this device. So who knows this, what this device is? Anybody seen this before? It's really easy. I already told it. <laughs> Have anyone uh, met this device before? It's called a micro bit. Uh, so what's nice about this device is if you heard about the BBC Micro, it was basically a computer uh, that was revolutionizing teaching uh, computer science back in the days, I think it was the 80s, uh, in the UK. So what they did, hey, IoT is all the rage. Why don't just give people a opportunity to be able to create applications and hardware. I work with hardware out of the school. And that's when they came up with a thing called BBC Micro Bit. And actually every single person in fifth grade, I think, gets one of these devices and they can play around with it. What's nice about it is because you don't have to have like complicated programs. You don't have to have anything complicated. You just plug it in. You just go to your website. You can create a web, uh, create a create a game on the website, uh, or create a program on the website. You just click the download button. It downloads you an hex file, a hex file. The device appears as a uh, pen drive. You just drag over the downloaded hex file, and it flashes automatically. It restarts, and it has all the things that you would want to need to play around with hardware. It has 25 LEDs, it has a few buttons, it has built-in Bluetooth, built-in uh, SRO meter, and the built-in compass, so you have sensors that you can detect. So what you can do, you can also connect extra devices to this. So let me just turn this on, so you can see what I'm talking about. So now I'm plugging it in, it's going to boot up. You, you're going to see it opens the device. So this is where I can download the applications, the hex files. And you can see it's going to run some, some demo. Uh, but what you can do is on the bottom, you can see all these pins. So you can do is you can just plug this pins into an extra device. And then you can use and add extra hardware. For example, a whatever, for example, an OLED screen. And at that point, 
you are at a point when you can create your own gaming hardware just by plugging a screen into a, a, a device like this one and just play around with it. But the program, problem is you only have two buttons. So what if you wanted to play uh, coding, uh, Happy Coding Invaders? You need three buttons. You have to fire, you have to uh, move the turret. So you can just use the accelerometer that's built into your hardware or built into your phone and just detect when you tilt the device, you move the turret. And when you push the actual button, then it fires. This, the whole thinking that involves uh, is purely progressive enhancement. You have to make sure that your thing that you just created works the same, or si no, uh, not works the same, that works uh, acceptably uh, on a variety of devices. Even devices that nobody have made before. Even devices that nobody could come up with. That's the beauty of the VR, because it works with a bunch of devices that nobody had, been, uh, had created before. Google just announced their standalone headsets that use optical tracking of your surroundings to be able to position the headset movement so you don't need those ugly poles and devices and thousand dollars or harder. So the device itself is self-contained and detects your movement inside of space. And WebVR will work with those devices because, because that's what standards are for. That's what you know, progressive enhancement and thinking forward means, is those devices will just work out of the box because they use the same primitives that other more complex devices were using. And just one more thing, uh, if you want to you know, try one of these or try one of the demos, so I can show you, uh, you can use the cld.by to try the cloud uh, slash invaders to try the uh, 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 cloud invaders. Uh, you can use the cld.by slash rule.js to try the Dino game. And there is a version of the Dino game I literally put together in like half an hour uh, that uses a fox. Uh, we were at the Mozilla uh, all hands uh, meeting. And I was like, how cool would that be if they, they were giving away these booklets? I was like, how cool would it be how cool it would be if actually you were not jumping around with a dino, but with a fox. And if uh, anybody here did uh, pixel graphics on the IoT devices, I will show you what you will have to put up, uh, what you had to put up with. So here is our Code Invaders demo. And what you see here, like when you are working uh, with games on the web, you know, what you're used to be seeing is, device, uh, is things like this, right? Hey, I have a, a graphics, a pixel graphics image, right? So how this works when you are actually, oops. So how this works when you are actually using a, let me just compile this first. When you are in Arduino C code, you know, what happens is these images end up being this. That's like binary representation of all the pixels in the image. Now, if you ever wanted to change those images, you would have to either create a new image and compare uh, and create those binary representations with the tool. There are some tools that you could download even on the web, a few tools. But it's not very nice, right? Like looking at binary code like this is not very nice. Uh, but this is just a web, right? This is a web browser here. So what you could do is create your own tools. Because translating between visual representations and binary representations, that's the thing that computers do very well. That's all the encodings we do is translating from something human visible into binary and back. So you could just have the computer do this and create a user interface that exposes you the graphical user in interface and just lets you uh, create uh, the way you used to it. So when you see me scrolling through the binary code, you actually see how this image is built. You actually see every 255 byte, uh, uh, 255 variations, every bytes will give you eight pixels. 
if you know what a byte consists consists of, a byte consists of eight bits that you can turn on and off. It actually becomes not just a tool that you can use to create, but it uh, becomes a learning tool, a debugging tool, an inspection tool. Even if you just downloaded a game from somebody, you can look into the code that they created. And you know, if I'm just going to change this seven to a zero, uh, or like uh, as totally a zero, like itself, you'll see the image change. If I do this, change this to FF, the image will change into a full row. So the seven, whatever. So it becomes, in itself, it becomes a learning tool. Uh, but you don't want to muck around bit, bits and bytes usually. So what you would want to do is actually you would want to be able to create something that you can edit however you want it. So here we have our favorite invader, Space Invader. So I'm just going to you know, yuck around a bit. Whatever, you don't even have to do this on your, your laptop. You can just sync this up and use this on your mobile phone. Uh, if you look at the slides, I'm going to post the slides link uh, in a moment. You can sync two devices together. So you can use your phone and your fingers to draw your new pixel images and not have to mac around on the touchpad of your laptop and just have the same image, same outcome in your device. I just make this like... be a creepy one. I'm sorry for that. I hope I'm not causing any nightmares. I just say this. This works. So I'm gonna save. And what you're gonna see is it gonna show up. A different image is gonna show up. So if I'm so you'll see the image just changed. So what I do now is I tell you the computer, hey computer, translate this to C code. I get the C code back. And you will see that the new image has appeared and it's completely changed. So now I can do, and I can tell the computer, but for that I will need to hook up uh, my favorite Cloud Boy device. There you go. So what I can say is let me show the camera. Yeah. So you see the device? Now I plugged it into a USB port. And I say flash. So what happens in the background? The image is compiled on a server, or even locally. And then the computer, you see it flashing, uses the local Node.js server to push the compiled hexi file onto the device itself. So it uses the USB connection through something called Node serial port to push this image onto the device. And if I do a close up, but ah, there is our creepy, creepy thing, and it's the same game. You can shoot the creepy things off the air just the same. And you don't have to do this all the time. You just have to make your game and then compile it and put it on the device. You can create this game in the browser uh, without having to flash it, compile it all the time. And you know, now I'm pushing this device through through the through the Arduino boy. Uh, uh, but you know how 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 Morpheus says in the Matrix. You know, no, I I I'm telling you now that you know when you are gonna be ready, you don't even need to. You don't even gonna be needing to be able to, uh, you know, uh, avoid all the bullets that they are shooting at you. And that's what happens. Uh, no spoilers, but you will see if you will have watched the movie. And this is also that you don't even need a USB connection because. IoT devices are, this one is a PugJS device. You can just push code onto it by connecting it via Bluetooth. Or just as I showed you, uh, the BBC Microbit, just hook it up to the computer and download it, uh, the hexi file. You can also flash the, uh, the BBC Microbit via a Android app. You don't need anything, you just need an Android app and the Android app can push the, uh, the hexi file onto, onto the device over the air via Bluetooth. Or, if you haven't seen this, this is one of my favorites. So, yes, it is what you think it is. It is a tiny arcade machine, which is exactly the name of the machine. It's a tiny arcade. 
and it's basically a very powerful tiny uh device with colorful screen and it also like you you get you know you get the flappy bird around and, sh and what it has it actually has a i don't know if you can see it but i can try to da da there is an sd card in there so you can either use an sd card and put your games on there or just Connect it to your computer. Oops, I just lost the SD card. Do you know if they make this bigger? Uh, what you can also do is just hook it up via USB and it also exposes itself as a pen drive. So you can just say, upload games or uh, your own programs to it. This is the next stop. So what you see here, is actually a demo for the tiny arcade because you can switch between once you created a, a, a code that runs on one device there is nothing stopping you from creating code that runs in different kinds of devices be that the uh, tiny arcade be that the uh, be that the BGC micro bit or any other devices so basically that's where we end and yeah if you look at the uh, the demo, you will see the, uh, you get the slides, you will see the demo, how it works when uh, you're using different devices, you can try the demos, and uh, you will find the slides on talk.flog.is slash play, uh, feel free to explore Cloudoboy, the Twitter handle, so all this, what you see here is very much beta at this point, but it kind of works, and it's kind of cool, so, and it's kind of totally open source. So if you wanted to try it out or wanted to talk about it, maybe contribute, uh, just get in touch. You will see my contacts on the bottom. And thank you for listening. If you wanted to try this or the VR kit, don't go anywhere. And uh, thank you for listening. So like I said, I'm still here. So if you want to try, ask questions, that's fine. Uh, if you have a question that you think might be interesting for everybody else here, uh, we want to point out the elephant in the room, please uh, do now. Any questions? Or you just wanted to get a plushie. <laughs> that works as well. I mean, we're humans, mostly. No questions? Three, two, one. Okay, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the night.